in a dark world filled with deceit. One united voice is crying out. Revealing the truth of God's word. It's time to expose the hidden truth. And unravel the lies. While we're living in Satan's little season. With Sister Crystal and Brother Phil. Welcome to Living in Satan's Little Season show. We're your hosts. Sister Crystal. And Brother Phil. Topic today, the three positions of the Gog Magog War. Since I did my Gog Magog shows, I've had a lot of, I should say, um, feedback. I guess it's the best word I could use. How I, you know, I believe it's a, it's a past event that's happened. And my, my reasoning for that is simply because the weapons used and all that stuff. Well, I've got a number of comments from people that were disagreeing with me and everything. So what I did was I compiled a list of basically the three positions that you could have on the Gog Magog war. And we're going to go over those today because I really don't see, I haven't, there might be some other ones, but I've never heard of any other ones. But doing my research on this Gog Magog event that's supposed to happen at the end, right before the Great White Throne Judgment. And we're going to discover what are what most people, what Christians in the in the Christian community kind of believe about this. Right, it definitely was a real event mentioned in the Bible. I know we've come from past camp that we thought it was in our timeline, but if you read the scriptures and you you know just let everything kind of meld in your heart and mind as you read them, you kind of come to this conclusion that maybe it wasn't meant for us. Maybe it happened as a past event. And, I mean, that just makes so much more clear of the positioning of where it should belong. And according to what the scriptures say, all of it has to do with having peace about your understanding of the scriptures. Right now, we're going to just read in Revelation chapter 20, the three verses that discusses Gog Magog War. Okay, and we're going to look into this here and see, okay, does it fit on what's going on? Just to review, we're going to read those three verses, and then I'm going to go over the first position that a lot of, some people take on what, what this Gog Magog war is. So go ahead, honey, if you want to read um, Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 7 there. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog together gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So those are the three verses. We've you know read this numerous times on the show. But it's good to get a review of what we're talking about here. So the first position that I really have seen people talk about is this Gog-Magog war was actually the same one as Armageddon. And there's been a, a couple of groups that talk about that. Well, for one thing, the full preterists, they believe it's the same war, but what the way that they do it is, of course, this is after the thousand years have expired. So their idea is that the Gog Magog War is after the thousand years, but the thousand years was between Christ's ascension and his return at Armageddon forty years later. So their their their, their position is that the thousand year reign of Christ was shrunk down to forty years. And it was just kind of hyperbole that, that that's being used to explain that it, it wasn't really a literal thousand years. It was more of a figurative thousand years. And that Christ and the saints were reigning in heaven during that time. Right. And they weren't reigning actually on this earth right. during those thousand years. Right. Or I should say 40 years that they say um, is, is the thousand year reign of Christ. So that's kind of their position on, on it. And so there, it's more of like hyperbole. The thousand years not to be taken like a literal one thousand. It's just sort of like it, you. It, it's take. It's meant to be taken more figuratively. And the Christ and the saints were actually reigning during that time 
in heaven mm. as opposed. But then my question is, is like, well, wait a minute. Now the saints are the ones, aren't they the ones that um, didn't take the mark and all that? Well, when did that show? You know, so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, when these saints showed up, because I thought the saints were the ones that didn't take the mark of the beast. Right. And that really wouldn't make any sense to me. Cause it's like, well, wait a minute now when the mark shows up and then it, how can they be reigning the whole time? with Christ for a thousand years if they didn't really die until really the, the most of them didn't even die until the last seven years or so. Right. Exactly. You know? Cause they, they were, they were the ones going through the great, the uh, great tribulation. tribulation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the very end, you know, where all the, uh, 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 most of the apostles were all killed. Right. Okay. So that, really didn't, but then there's another group that kind of believes that, okay, there's actually two Gog Magog wars. Okay. And this is one that kind of threw me off. Cause it's like, well, wait a minute, two Gog Magog. Yeah. The Gog Magog war in Ezekiel refers to Armageddon. The one in Revelation here refers to a future Gog Magog war. So the, the, the second position, which kind of fits in with the Gog Magog war, is that there's two Gog Magog wars. The one in Ezekiel, which is different, and that's talking about Armageddon, but then the one in Revelation here, chapter 20, is talking about a future Gog Magog War. I mean, I, I was trying to figure out, well, you know, what evidence do you have to back this up? Okay, I'm going to read you <laughs> the scriptures used to um, verify that these are, that the Gog Magog War, I mean, the Gog Magog War of Ezekiel is the same war as the one as, as Armageddon. Okay, and the way they explain it is in Revelation chapter 19. We're going to read this really quick. Because it describes th- this th- a little bit of this Armageddon event war. It's because there's a bunch of seals broken and all this other stuff. Right. So we're going to read Revelation 19, verse 17 through 21 there. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly at in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and the great armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he dero- he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. The, the main point here is that this idea that these birds and animals are going to be feeding on the flesh of all these, quote, kings and this army. We're going to read Ezekiel here because a similar thing happens in Ezekiel. Okay. okay. So this is why this is their, uh, I, I should say, proof text on how they say, no, see, this Ezekiel passage is actually talking about Armageddon because both of the passages talk about animals feeding on the flesh. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 39. I'm going to start with verse 17 there and go ahead and read that one. And you, son of man, say, thus says the Lord, say to every winged bird and to all the wild beasts of the field, gather yourselves and come, gather yourselves from all places round about to my sacrifice, which I have made for you, even a great sacrifice on the mountain of Israel. And you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of mighty men. You shall drink the blood of the prince of the earth. Rams and calves and goats, and they are all fatted calves. And you shall eat fat till you are full. You shall drink wine till you are drunk of my sacrifice, which I have prepared for you. And you shall be filled at my table eating horse and rider and mighty men and every warrior, says the Lord. Okay, so again, here's a kind of description of the animals, you know, chowing down on the corpses <laughs> of all these all these people that, you know, basically died in this war. 
when fire rained down from heaven and you know destroyed all those armies and whatnot in, in, in that's described here in Revelation and in Ezekiel. So this is why here on the Revelation passage, obviously fire rained down from heaven isn't really mentioned here in the Revelation 19, but in the Ezekiel passage, it just both of them described animals eating the the armies after the war is over. And obviously, if you got a bunch of dead bodies, I think this is going to be this almost this is a similar thing for every war. I would think that you're going to have all these corpses around, especially when you have a lot of dead bodies. And of course, you know it takes time to pick up and clean all these dead bodies. You know, it's like, you're not just going to have oh we're just going to. Um, just have a cleanup effort for the, in one day and be able to clean up, you know, the thousands and thousands of dead bodies sitting there. No, I, I would guess that it, was, it, was, it would take a long time, especially under the old way that they used to do things, to get all the bodies and kind of scoop them all up and do something with them. Well, know? yeah, and it seems as though if you had nature <laughs> help in the cleanup efforts, then it would be less to do. <laughs> and that's essentially what both these are describing. Basically, major wars, major battles, a lot of dead bodies. And obviously, you're going to have animals eating on those dead bodies afterwards because it takes a little while to clean them up. And you know, animals can help do that a little well, bit. Well, and you know? that's kind of nature. In fact, bugs also help in the decomposing of the human flesh. So do um, uh, birds that, that feed on, you know... Um, uh, decaying and you know um, all yeah. sorts of animals like that vultures that, yes, and things of that nature yes. you know we all seen all the movies you know vultures are you know buzzing around the dead bodies waiting to you know get their kill or whatever you know or, and waiting for somebody to die so they can eat their corpses you know there's animals that do that of course and so the both these in any war that has a lot of losses right. is to me it's it's weak to say well this is the only similarity is that you have a bunch of dead bodies but the second position I want to go into, and these mostly people that believe that millennial reign of Christ hasn't happened yet, and Christ has not returned yet. And that's these people. As the second position is that this, both the Ezekiel and Revelation pa- passage is talking about a future war. Obviously, you know the way that they describe it. There's a couple of ways they can do this. Okay, since Ezekiel did not understand all the, you know, when he had this vision of this this Gog Magog war. He had to use what's known as modern equivalents. In other words, his he didn't understand what tanks and all these things were and these modern weapons that we would use in war. So he described these in ways that his reader would understand. Hmm. And that's what most, I would say, evangelical Christians, of course, they believe this is still, this, this war is still over a thousand years in the future because they don't believe Christ has returned yet. They, they don't believe he's, his millennial reign has happened yet. So this war is well into our future. Well, I'm over gonna, a thousand years from now. Well, I'm going to interject here and say I'm not even sure if Christians in the churches today actually study this. I think maybe it's brought up that this is what we believe or this is the so called synopsis of whole thoughts on how it kind of, you know, where it falls into our timeline. But as far as like studying it and understanding all the ins and outs of the details of it, I don't think, because I can tell you right now, I didn't know. I, we didn't really study it. I don't really remember. I maybe had a sermon or two on um, Jesus' return, but I don't really remember any preachers or teachers ever going in depth about the Gog, Magog War, about when it occurred or how it occurred or even the weaponry or any of this. I mean, this is all kind of, new to me. I mean, I, I understood that maybe, and that's why we were in the camp, that we thought maybe it would happen in our future, but maybe of a way that we could relate to. But, you know, we really want the truth of God's word. We have to take it in the context of how it was written. I'm trying to find, well, let's find some position, position right? papers. I was trying to do some research. <laughs> and of course, because this is a thousand years in the future for most people, nothing's written about it because they don't really care about it. They're more interested in Armageddon, which they think is right around the corner. Right. And we all know it in the, that's listening to the show. No, no, this is a war that's well into our past now. But of course, they're looking at that and going, okay, Armageddon's the only thing we really care about because that's coming up in our, you know, supposedly right around the corner. But in this, obviously this Gog Magog war is a thousand years in the future. Why should we care about that right now? So there's not much written about it, but I did get a quote here. And, and, and this is one of the things I, to explain this, they said, there are no planes, tanks, missiles, and so forth in the prophet's narrative. The customary interpretation is of course, that Ezekiel knew nothing about modern weapons when he wrote some 
3,500 years ago. And so he had to describe using terms of ancient warfare, such as swords, shields, bucklers, horses, etc. That may be the case, but it's possible that at the time of the war takes place, and this is another thing that comes up, okay? And, you know, it's kind of hard to believe people are in such denial. They really do believe this is the same war. Another possible thing is that a nuclear holocaust mm. has blown us back into the Stone Age. I'm not kidding you. This is a possible explanation of why they're using those ancient warfare techniques. Well, <laughs> if you look at some things today, things are explained why things aren't used the way they were used maybe in the 60s or, you know, things that were done. And so the idea is some strategic event was going to or will have to occur for all of this to come out in the way it's written. The idea, though, is we maybe think too highly of ourselves to think that this is something that has happened in the past and it's written the way it was and did actually take place. You really have to be stretching your imagination to think that, okay, we're going to go through a nuclear holocaust, like a Mad Max scenario. Yeah. We're going through a nuclear holocaust <laughs> and everybody's been blown back in the Stone Age where we're using swords, bucklers, spears, etc. to fight wars now. I mean, I just find this so... I mean, th this would be a thousand years in the future here. Well, it would be Over like, a thousand years. It would be like all the equipment that we make this and newfound technology and weaponry would have all have also been demolished in said war. Yeah, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so we have foundries that we can build all that stuff, but we can't figure out how to, like, <laughs> get... I, I just find this so amazing, but this is how people try to explain these things. Because, obviously, the Gog Magog in Revelation, it's undeniable, in my opinion, that it's referencing the, re the Ezekiel. Because mm -hmm. it's the only place in the Bible that Gog Magog is mentioned in the same sentence. So it's obvious that the author of Revelation, John, is referring to the Ezekiel War because he says Gog and Magog. Right. And so there's only one war that Gog and Magog is mentioned in our Bibles, and that's in Ezekiel chapter 30, 38 and 39. Well, I think it's interesting that to put all the pieces together, we would have to understand how it's said in Revelation and then see how it's referred to in Ezekiel. And be okay with, if it did already happen, that, you know, maybe that's what's holding us back. I think that was the missing piece that we really, once, but the thing is, once you hear it in context, you understand it, and you actually accept it, that it was a past event, there's so much peace that you can get from that, that you don't have to twist it and work it to where it has to fit the way you want it to, because we all know. The pieces of a puzzle fit the way the puzzle is designed to work. And all the pieces are made for a specific part of the puzzle to bring that design or picture to to fruition and to light. The problem is, is if we force puzzle pieces to go in a way we want them to, but just because we want it to fit the way we want it to fit, it doesn't make the picture look at all the way it was designed to look. And I think that's the thing, is sometimes we have to get our biases and our own design out of the way and just be simple and humble enough to accept the scriptures the way they're they're written and I, honestly i believe that god wants truth seekers people who want to know his truth and can look at a scripture and can trace that connection back to another scripture because that's i believe the bread comes that God has given us in his word. It's hard to believe, okay, that a thousand years in the future, and this is kind of, we're still going back to what these people, it's a future war, but a thousand years from the future, we're going to be going back to, we're on horses, and, you know, we're going to be using swords and spears and, and bucklers and all these, <laughs> we're going to be using all these weapons again now, folks. Right. Uh, this is, I mean, this is pretty delusional in my opinion, but, you know, this, this in order to fit the theology of people, they have to... And this is where I'm going to go... This is my position. We're going to go to number three, which is my position. Okay. It was a past war, but it was after the 1,000... The literal 1,000-year reign of Christ. Right. Just as the Bible states. Mm -hmm. The Bible states that after the 1,000 years were finished, then Satan was deceiving the nations. We're on the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. So this, I believe... And these are the, the the Gentile nations 
the, what they call the Gentiles or ethos, which is where we get ethnic groups. That's where the people that are going up against the camp of the saints. Mm-hmm. They were going and attacking. And I think, again, I've had a show on when I believe this happened, 1360, right around there, A.D., you got the thousand-year reign of Christ, and it, it, it finishes at 10, 1070 A.D., Satan's little season for 335 years, and within that Satan's little season, you know, around 1360 is when I think this Gog Magog war happened. And I, I had previous shows explaining what I, why I think that happened. And I, I did the research, and it looks like, yes, all those things in 1360. This is really before the advent of gunpowder used in modern weaponry. And everyone would be using horses. Matter right. of fact, they were using horses up until the 20th century. So, right. you know, a lot of these weapons, I'd say about 90% of the weapons were used up until the last couple hundred years. But maybe some of the other ones were used kind of way back then before. Once gunpowder rolled around, and this is like in the 1500s, you right. know, shortly after this, then, the, you know, you started, some of these things started to go out of, you know, you know out of. Well, I'm sure that at some form. point. Or later on in history, maybe some of these weapons, you know, shields and whatnot might have been used. But the idea that all throughout history, weaponry of this stature was used readily in battle. And it, it just fits in all the narrative of so many accounts in history of places all around the world, China to different cultures all around that had those kind of weaponry. It's fascinating to look into that. But it's not something that we would technically use today, which really negates this uh, a few, as a future get event. It doesn't seem like it would make, fit in that piece of the puzzle to that degree. But, you know, this is something that if we look and we were honest with how it is describing everything, it only fits where it should fit and not anywhere else. I'm trying to be as consistent as possible. Mm-hmm. And my my position, I believe, is most consistent because you still have the 1,000 literal reign of Christ. Right. And then immediately after that is when, at 10, 1070 or so, is when Satan goes out and starts deceiving all the Gentile nations around the world to go to war against the camp of the saints. And then I believe that happened around 1360, that this Gog Magog war event took place. And they would have been using all these weapons. Now let's read Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 4, because it talks about some of these weapons that he used. And I will gather you and all your army, horses and horsemen, all wearing breastplates with a great multitude, shields and helmets and swords. Just the description. Matter of fact, I find the description here to be almost over the top trying to explain all these weapons that are used in excruciating detail So I think it was given so that we could know if it was in our past or in our future. I really believe that this is a reason why all this detail, this war in Ezekiel. No other war, let me explain this. I've read the Bible so many times. I don't remember (laughs) another war where details of weaponry used as much as this war. Right. Honestly, there's not another war that you see as much detail of what weapons were used during a war. So, in my opinion, this is God is giving us a big hint of when this happened. You can look up every war in, your, in the Bible. Go ahead and do it. You try to find all the details, and there, that isn't the only place. So, here it talks about horses, horsemen, bucklers, shields, swords, a massive army that's taking plunder, mm-hmm. gold, silver, livestock. Okay, this is nothing, not, not all, all these things were, would be nothing that we'd be doing today. When we do wars today, we don't, we're not going after, quote, plunder. It's always for some other uh, other political reason. Right. But you go to Ezekiel chapter 39. Okay, just the next chapter over. It gives even more information on this thing. Okay, verse 3 talks about this. And I will destroy the bow out of your hand and arrows out of your right hand. And I'll cast you down the mountains of Israel. In other words, okay, so they were using bows and arrows too. Mm-hmm. You go on to verse 6, uh, verse 9. And it says, and they... They that inhabit cities of Israel shall come forth and make a fire with the arms, the shields, the spears. So now we learn about spears now. They had spears, the bows and arrows, they had javelins and lances, and they shall keep the fire burning with them for seven years. So Mm. in other words, it's talking about all these wooden weapons, right? 
like like javelins, spears, bows and arrows. They're just burning all that stuff at the end of this war. Okay, stuff that we and that's why I'm saying if you if these are modern equivalences, we don't use wood weapons in our war anymore. As well, far as you I know, can tell. they were metal tipped you know. weapons with a wooden handle. Why but would the they idea, be burning? <laughs> the idea, though, is that you know these are weapons that. Maybe you see in a time frame movie that had in that in an epic movie that had that and needed that in that time frame, but we don't use these weapons. Maybe there are people that make weaponry for such events to reenact them and whatever, and they might use these kind of weapons. But I mean, lances. I just think of yeah, that's something you'd see definitely in the, maybe in the Middle <laughs> Ages at the latest. But after that, no, you, you well, nobody would be using lances on because you use those on horses. Right, lances are used, you know, to you know poke people on horse from horseback right. to go attack if you if, if you're running it, it obviously what would be the modern equivalent of that i mean no we don't use a lot of these weapons anymore because all this modern weaponry we use today maybe the javelin is what they use in the olympics i don't know but they yeah. throw it but the idea though is you know when i was thinking of this verse and even the one you used you you quoted um previous was the armor of god and how all of those are equated to certain aspects of armor, the helmet, the breastplate, the shield, and all these. But it's equated to things in the Christian um, arsenal of how to use and refute evil against us. But that doesn't mean that the Bible is what it says it, you know, it, it, it is what it says it is, but it's not a, it's a figurative form of what the Bible is. Not that the Bible is used as the, the sword of truth, you know, it's, it, it's not an actual sword per se. But it does obtain the truth. Idea though is that these items do seem like they fit into a battle that was a past event, and it fits right into my timeline here, exactly as you know, one thousand year reign of Christ, right after the one thousand year reign of Christ, which would end. It fits right in there. Now, there's four. Also, there's even though there's only really two or three verses in Revelation that talks about this war. <laughs> there's four similarities. In those two verses that talk about the same as Ezekiel. We're going to go into that right now. What are, what are the same in the Revelation passage to the Ezekiel passage? One, first similarity. Gog and Magog are mentioned in both passages. Okay. To me, that's a huge, you know, tell. I mean, it's like the author is trying to tell us which war they're, they're talking about. Oh, just go look up that Gog Magog war in, 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 in your Bibles, and this is the war I'm talking about here. Right. Why else would he mention Gog Magog if he, he was talking? Eh, it's about that war in Ezekiel. Just go back in yeah. Ezekiel and read about this. He okay? name dropped on that one. Yeah, it was an you know, it was obvious reference yeah. to a war that we can look up in our Bibles, right. and this Gog Magog war in Ezekiel chapter thirty eight and thirty nine is the only place that Gog Magog is mentioned. I've heard people say, oh, well, Gog Magog is mentioned back in Revelation. No, it's just Magog is mentioned back then. One, one, it's not Gog Magog. So the only other place in the Bible Gog Magog is mentioned is in Ezekiel chapter 39. And it's discussing a war. And there's not only that similarity, but of course, this Ezekiel war and also the Revelation war also has this massive army coming up against. Mm -hmm. So that's another similarity they have. They have this huge army coming up against the camp of the saints. Of course they don't here in Ezekiel they don't talk about talk about being the camp of the saints. They just talk about it this a massive, massive army. But there's another thing. Of course we know when this is going to happen right before the Great White Throne Judgment. Right. This is really the last event that happens before the Great White Throne Judgment in Revelation. Well mm -hmm. believe it or not Let's go ahead and read read Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel gives a little hint here about when this war was going to take transpire. So you want to go ahead and read Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 16. And you shall come upon my people, Israel, as a cloud to cover the land. It shall come to pass in the last days that I will bring you up upon my land and that all the nations may know me when I am sanctified in you before them. So he gives us a hint on when this war is going to take place. And he says in the last days. And this is exactly, as you can see in, Revel in Revelation passage. Right. That it, it's precisely in the last days. See, again, that the word days 
it really, when she say today, we would say the last years, but you know, that's why they use days as years. A lot of times it, it, all these places do that. That's why I'm saying in Revel Ezekiel uses days as years. Cause he would say the last, if we were saying it today, we'd say in the last years, this is what's going to happen. Right. But here they always use the word days. So it's days as years, but that last, the word last, you know, that word eschatos where we get mm -hmm. the word eschatology. Right. So in the eschatology days, mm -hmm. I will bring you. So again, we even use that, you know, eschatology, the study of the last days mm -hmm. that we're talking about here. Again, that, that's that word last. Okay. So he's talking about the last days. And so this is precisely what you see, you know, so they're both of them talking about the last days. Ezekiel even tells us. A really interesting point that cleared up for me. When we as believers read this, we think our last days. We automatically jump to, this must be t talking about our last days in this reality of our timeline. When, in essence, it's really referring to the last days of the timeline for them. Well, it's the last days of everything. Yeah, right. it's, it's everything's going to happen in those last days. And so this fits perfectly with Ezekiel and Daniel also fit perfectly together too. Because Daniel also talks about days as years. And Ezekiel does the same exact thing, especially when it's talking about these future events. It always, and there, and there, to us, we would describe it as last years. Because right. this was obviously years and years in the future from Ezekiel. Right. But he always talks about it being the last days. Well, you know. what I think confuses a lot of contemporary Christians right now is that are not are, are we not in the last days? Like, you know, we're thinking this is, you know, we're living right now. So is time going to end at some point and we are in the last days? We're not really configuring that the last days could be of uh, another time frame that, uh, that this applied to. So it's like, for me, I can wrap my understanding, my brain around the idea that this was allotted for that time frame for their, quote, the last days. But time still moves on for those who are existing now. Well, see, to, uh, to us, we're beyond all the last days. Right. Like, like I say, the, the time will never end. When they talk about last days, they're talking about the last days of the end of, cer of a certain age. Right. Of course, this one is the age of when, right before the Great White Throne Judgment. That was the end of the age, really, of of everything, of what's going to happen with all the dead and everything. So, mm -hmm. obviously, that was the end of, end of, of those days. And then, of course, now we're beyond the end of those days. And what we do is now it's our job is just to, just to hunker down. Right. You know, do what Christ wants us to do. Same thing as everybody else had to do throughout history. We're just doing the same thing. You know, being faithful to the Lord. Right. You know, loving God, loving our neighbor as ourselves, that kind of thing. That's what we're supposed to do here. But we're not having to worry about these events that could happen in our timeline. That's the beauty of it, I think. By reading this and acknowledging and understanding of how the, it kind of played out, it makes more sense and it gives me more peace. I don't know about you or anyone listening. If you read this and then you pray about it and then you allow the events to kind of play out the way it seems most of the logically in the way scriptures are referring it to, it just, it sets with me that this is the way it should have been. And I have this relief and this peace that, okay, I can, I can understand this. I can see this all fits perfectly the way it is described in the puzzle. And I can see it clearly. I don't have to force it to turn yep. and fit the way I want it to because I have a narrative that I want it played out in my reality. Everything fits perfectly. That's why I like about my position mm. it, it, because I don't have to make excuses for the thousand year reign of Christ. Nope. It's a thousand years. Just like it says. Right. I believe exactly what the Bible says. And this war happened in the last days. That's exactly what happened. And the last years, just before the Great White Throne Judgment. But it was a past event. That's why the Great White Throne Judgment already happened. But, of course, and of course, the last similarity between these Ezekiel and Revelation passages is this fire raining down from heaven and destroying these armies. Now, we're going to read Ezekiel, because we already read Revelation passage about mm -hmm. that. Now let's read Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 22. And it talks about the same thing. And I will judge him with pestilence and blood and sweeping rain, and hailstones. And I will rain upon him fire and brimstone, and upon all that are with him, and upon many nations with him. So again, you know, he, of course here in the Ezekiel passage, you get a lot more 
it added details on what happened in this war. It wasn't just fire raining down from heaven to destroy him. It was also pestilence, blood, sweeping rain, hailstones. You got brimstone also going with the, with right. the, no, with the fire, say, too. Sounds like what happened at Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Gomorrah right. Yeah, sounds like the Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> event. Like, or, and to or a what happened with Moses on, on the Egyptians, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the Ezekiel passage gives a lot more detail. Matter of fact, on the verse above that, it says that I will summon against them every fear, says the Lord, and sword against every man and against his brother. In other words, it seems like the army was even killing itself yes. before the war. Too. So the, he, God was destroying his army, not only from within, but also right. from the, with the elements. That happened in other battles in the Bible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God used that, you know, killing each other off. Right. In, because anytime you bring a bunch of people together... Uh, Chaos with, with, with different nation states, which is what is described here in this mm-hmm. Ezekiel passage, you know they're not always going to get along, and God's going to use that to well, instigate no, fighting amongst each other. Things are going to happen, and people aren't going to know who the enemy is, and then there's you know they're killing one another, not realizing it. Yeah, so God used a number of different ways. So again, four different similarities between all mm-hmm. these things: Gog, Magog, massive army. That the, the war is in the end of the days, just like they, both of them say that, and also fire raining down from heaven and destroying both armies. Too many similarities. It's the same war. It makes all the sense in the world. There's no reason to make any excuses now. We, and we know primary, I think we know pretty much what, close to what year this happened. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the 1300s, to me, it describes the golden hordes that even history talks about with, you know, Genghis Khan and all, those, all the golden, golden hordes. It kind of describes to me kind of like these, this group of people, you know, riding around the horses wow. with bows and arrows and, you know, attacking and all that. And this is kind of what I, what I just, what it describes. If, if you understand the weaponry and the tools that these armies used in their battling, then you also understand that why would they go to battle? Well, I said earlier that they went to battle for plunder and gold, silver, right. uh, livestock. Yeah, right. they're going so for that. All of that stuff, it just seems to fit. What would be the reason for, well, you know, we have had wars in our age where, you know, it was fighting over commodities of oil or whatever it was you want to put it there. That is kind of what people see as valuable. But back then it was possessions and it was kind of material things. That makes so much more sense. And the whole idea that these large masses of armies, I mean, I just don't see, you know, we talk about how many people are, are on in our world. But I just don't see the seas of of armies attacking a place. It's just like you know, a numeral the, as the sands of the seashore. It just yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, we don't use big armies anymore either. That, that's something that was done well into our past. Today, mm-hmm. it's special forces going around. It's always small armies. It's all has to do with you know a uh, an elite we, yeah, trained an elite trained small forces right. because. You don't want to send a big army in there and a missile takes a whole army out. Because that's essentially what can happen today. You know, today, a big army is just a, dis- a disaster waiting to happen. Well, you know, there's a lot of variables that a lot of commanders right now would never even um, put an army in vulnerable positioning like that. That's just no way. If these are great um, seasoned officers and, and commanders, they have strategies that are just far beyond the technology that they're describing of the weaponry. And I think it's just so creative to think, oh, this is going to happen. We're going to have to um, go back to that time. I don't know how many people could actually survive in that kind of timeline. If we have you know? to go back to where you were using spears and swords and everything, we are. I mean, I just don't ever see a thousand years from now, over a thousand years from now, that ever happening. So, you know, obviously these other ones, it, it doesn't fit the narrative that they're trying to teach. So they have to make it fit somehow. Oh, well, um, the thousand year reign of Christ is 40 years. It's like, well, that's quite a difference in years. I, right. I understand if it's close, but 40 years is nowhere close to a thousand years. But this is what these guys have to do to get everything to fit right. And I'm just telling you, you don't, they don't need to do any of that. Everything fits perfectly mm-hmm. if you just follow the, what the Bible teaches about everything. The thousand year reign of Christ happened, right? After the thousand year reign of Christ mm-hmm. in the 11th century is when Satan was loosed mm-hmm. and he, he got this army. That they would all be using these weapons back in the 11th century. Yep, this is what they'd be using back then. They all fought the war. It's perfect. Right, right. And um, of course, this all happened in our ancient past. Oh, I would I would use ancient. I, what I mean by that is hundreds of years ago. Obviously, this is 1300s. Right. So yeah, from for our our perspective, this was, you know, we don't know anybody that lived back then. We don't really know much about that part of history. But the point is, is this is when it happened. 
Now we're living beyond the end of days, the end of years, and now we're, we're living out the life and immediately we get our reward coming up. We're, you know, we're, we're waiting for New Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. We're waiting for our rewards. We're waiting for all that. We're, we're, we're going for the, the gusto. And all we have to do is remain fast and focused. Right. And not get, to get caught up in all these details. It'll never happen. Like this God made God war that was described by Ezekiel as being a past event. I think God did that for a reason. Right. To give us a hint that this was in our past, folks. God, I noticed that every part of the Bible gives us details about things. It's God trying to tell us something. I don't like to make excuses to say, oh, well, those weapons aren't real weapons that he was... No. If it says bucklers, spears, swords, that's what they were using. It's simple as that. It, we don't have to make excuses for the Bible. You just Amen. believe it, and, and uh, we believe what it says, and that's what it means. Really simple. If we can't take God and his word as the truth, then we might as well just walk away right now because... He does not want us to just follow him and then make up our own synopsis of how the scriptures are supposed to play out. He wants us to trust him at his word, point blank. And if this is what his word says, then we need to get behind it. And we need to go, okay, I'm going to shake off what I originally thought because it's not fitting with scripture. But I want it to fit the way I feel comfortable. But that's not what God wants. He doesn't want us to fit his word to where we feel comfortable. We, he wants us to fit into where his word is says the truth and where it's comfortable for us to be obedient to follow it and to allow it to um, mean what it says and to point to the direction where it occurred. And that's just, to me, that's humility. That's saying, okay, teach me, God. If I got it wrong, correct my thinking, put me in the right direction, and help me to honor you with the truth you give me. Yeah, praise the Lord that all this, all these um, events are really in our past. We don't <laughs> have to God. worry about all this stuff we're studying. I, I mean, I shouldn't even have to be addressing this this much, but you know what? You know, we have, we, we, we've been programmed in our brains to believe a certain way for all of our lives. And I, you know, I'm as guilty as everybody yes. else too, because I had to get out and just <laughs> by, by my biblical research, I've had to be like, okay, this isn't making sense. And I'm like, and then I have to go, okay, maybe my, my beliefs about this is wrong. And I have to change what I think about what the Bible actually states and actually take it seriously for what it says. And if you do that, it, everything makes sense. Mm-hmm. My timeline makes perfect sense. It already happened. It's, we're beyond the end of days now. And so now all we, all we're waiting for our reward if we endure to the end of this life. Because mm-hmm. now, now we're living in a new Satan's little season. <laughs> Not only because it's right there in our Bibles. But because it's the only thing that makes sense. Join or contact us at satanslowseason.org. This is a non-copyright Living in Satan's Low Season production.